am sharing my screen. Um, so this next session is about dance activism. We have three panelists um, who don't know each other, but I know each of them and they are extremely powerful. Um, this session explores the nature of dance as a means of protest and social activism. So the presenters will um, demonstrate ways that they use their own dance traditions for um, political commentary or peace activism and show dance as a powerful change agent. Um, the, um, so I'm going to skip over this and just introduce Anindo, who will be going first. Um, Anindo is from Kenya. Um, she lives in Los Angeles and uh, she also enjoyed a successful career all over the world. Um, she, um, she will be sharing her story first. And um, as you can see, she's both an accomplished dancer, uh, a musician and an incredible dance teacher which I know from having observed. <laughs> and um, the second panelist is Ananya, Ananya Chatterjee, um, who's, who is based in the Twin Cities in um, uh, Minneapolis. And she um, is originally from India. She works as a choreographer and dancer with her incredible company of all women of color dancers. Um, she is also incredible. And um, I'm keeping my interests short so you can hear more from them. And the third panelist is Annabella Lenzu, who is originally from Argentina. And uh, she has an incredible theatrical dance history, um, many years working in different parts of the world, as well as um, the city of New York. So I will leave it to them, if I can, sorry, figure out how to unshare. <laughs> and there we go. Um, so we'll start with you, Anindo. And sorry that everything is is running slightly late, but you all look beautiful. Um, <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to say hello to everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be here early in the morning. Um, California <laughs> time, it's about six something. <laughs> but yes. uh, I'm so happy to be here. I actually... Um, just, you know, you, you saw my bio, I don't need to talk about myself but so much, but uh, how I got here was very interesting because I basically, I'm a musician first and I um, left Kenya years ago after I finished, uh, my father wouldn't let me leave until I finished university, um, I finished university and then he, I got a recording contract to as a recording artist for EMI Records with EMI Records in Spain. And my, uh, my company was based in Madrid at that time. So I um, flew into Spain, signed my contract, and then I moved to Germany where, where I um, lived out my contract. You know, I had to record a couple of albums, I toured and all that stuff. And then I, uh, I wasn't planning on coming to the US. I was really planning on staying in Europe. It's close enough to Nairobi, but um, I got a, con uh, a call from my uh, uh, people that work with the United Nations representing Kenya and they asked me to come to New York because Kenya was hosting um, a fundraiser for UNICEF and they needed some talent. And um, I was like, oh, you New York? Why do I want to go to New York? <laughs> I'm okay here in Europe. So, because I wasn't thinking of coming to the US. It was just seemed too far away. And, you know, I just wanted to be close to home. And anyway, I um, ended up in New York uh, opening, I mean, doing this, this uh, performance, hosting the United Nations um, UNICEF, Children's Fund Raiser. 
And uh, during that time, I got a band together and uh, I had started learning how to dance when I was in Kenya. I, I, I did ballet um, with Madame Zerkovitz. I'll never forget her, this Russian woman who scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> but <laughs> she was very old school, very strict. And uh, um, I appreciate her now, you know, later on, years, years um, later. But and then I did also Dunham Technique. I was introduced to that in Kenya and a little bit of jazz from a German teacher. But uh, during my career as a, as a perform as a as a an artist, recording artist, I continued taking dance classes. Whenever we toured, I always try to find the studio close by so I can go and take class, continue my training. I continued taking ballet, but I was looking for Dunham technique, which I had fallen in love with when I was in Kenya, because I don't know if any of you know anything about dance. But Dunham technique is a combination of different dance disciplines. You have ballet, modern jazz. Um, and then you have cultural context, which is Miss um, Dunham, which I'll talk to you about in, in a minute. She, she um, infused cultural uh, dances within the technique. Uh, dances from uh, Caribbean islands, from Cuba, from Brazil, uh, from Africa, and then mix that all up with, with the technique, ballet technique and modern technique. And that is Dunham technique. And that I was drawn to because I love the idea of all these different techniques in one technique. And I was looking for that when I was on tour. Whenever I was stop in the city, I'd go to different dance studios, but no one taught uh, Dunham technique in Europe at that time, only Afro dancing. So when I came to New York and I was putting my show together, I needed a percussionist, I'm a drummer, and I, uh, I needed a percussionist to play with me while I performed. And they introduced me to Babatunde Olatunji, who was a Nigerian per uh, percussionist, very well known in New York. I got to meet him. and. His assistant uh, was a dance teacher. So uh, I met them both during rehearsal. And after the show, the show was amazing. And uh, I was about to go back. I had like three or four days uh, to just be a tourist in New York. And they said they had a dance class and they invited me to the dance class. And because uh, I wanted to learn how to play the djembe drama, you know, which I had seen in a festival they took me to. Uh, and I wanted to learn West African dancing, which I'd never done before because I'm from East Africa. So when I went into the class, uh, the teacher started warming up the dance class with Dunham technique. And I said, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this all over Europe, it's here. And, um, and then of course I started performing with, uh, I mean, drumming, learning the drumming with a Latunji. And so uh, Ronnie, Ronnie uh, Marshall at that time asked me if I wanted to meet Catherine Dunham because she had a seminar. And I said, yes, of course, and, but my visa wouldn't allow me because I was only here for that short time. It was a performance visa. This was in the 80s. So it was a very different time, uh, way before 9-11. So um, I really wanted to study Dunham technique and I wanted to study more drumming and, you know, because my, my contract was pretty much over with EMI records and I didn't want to renew because I wanted to do my own music, which I wanted to put my own African influence and they wanted to do like a different type of, I didn't have um, artistic control of my contract. So then I let go of my contract and uh, moved to the United States. And I continued studying with uh, Olatunji. I studied African dance and uh, studied with Catherine Dunham. We, I uh, was very grateful to open for the Grateful Dead. I had never heard of the Grateful Dead before. <laughs> Who are they? But you know, Olatunji, I was in the band with him and we opened for the Grateful Dead in Berkeley. There was about 25,000, they called them deadheads uh, in the crowd. <laughs> and uh, it was an amazing show. And then after that, we did three albums. I recorded with Carlos Santana and Ayerto, who's a very brilliant uh, Brazilian um, per uh, percussionist. And I continued studying. I was just a student at that time of dance and everything I could, I could grab. And uh, years and years later, I, was with Miss Dunham, my husband. I, I married the man who introduced me to uh, the technique. His name was Ronald Marshall. So he unfortunately passed away in 98. And I was working with Miss Dunham at that time. So um, Catherine Dunham asked me to, to be certified in her technique. And I'll tell you a little bit about Catherine Dunham. She is, um, and um, she, was a, she was an amazing and still is an, an icon in the modern dance. There are many, many books written about her. This one, I don't know if you can see, Catherine Dunham, A Way of Life, was written by my colleague. Um, her name is Dr. Alberta Rose from the university. She's retired, but she was a professor at the University of uh, San Francisco. 
Um, Catherine Dunham was uh, African American, and her mother was kind of reminds me of uh, Carolyn Carolyn Dunn. Her mom was Canadian, French Canadian, and her father was African American, and. Um, she was born in 1909 so that was the america she was born in you know you know what 1909 america was like very segregated and um so she, growing up and trying to learn dance uh, for her was quite a challenge because you know uh, she wanted to learn ballet but her ballet teacher who was russian and white in chicago she was actually born in outside of chicago uh she was not allowed to be in the dance class because she was of course black by law um, of segregation law, he couldn't allow her to come, but he really saw the talent. And so what he would do is close the studio and ask her to come after school at 5.30 through the back door quietly in. And, and that's how she started training her ballet um, in Chicago with him. And, uh, and she was so talented, you know, she reminds me of one of my students. One of my students is called Misty Copeland, who's very well known here in uh, the US now. I met Misty here in California when she was 12 and did a, a show with her. I'd pick her up from Long Beach and take her to rehearsals and so on. And now she's an amazing ballet uh, student, I mean, ballet professional. So Miss Dunham was like that. She started late and was just talented. And um, so she continued her studies in the US and but she kept wondering why, uh, when she, she went to University of Chicago and studied anthropology. And she was interested in creating anthropo dance anthropology because she wondered why do black people, indigenous people all over the world, no matter the poverty um, le level they are, when they dance, they just light, light up. That they, why they why do they dance the way they do? Why are they so happy when they dance? Yet they have the poverty, uh, the poverty rate. So she was that she was curious about that because when she saw them and they were dancing, they were lit up. So she wanted to study that. She wanted to find out why do black people dance the way they do, and she wanted to go to Africa for a fellowship through the university uh, and study that. But her professor suggested that she goes to the Caribbean because this was in the. 20s and 30s and she here's a female woman traveling by herself so he suggested for her to go to the caribbean so she went to um jamaica uh she went to martinique uh trinidad and also haiti where she fell in love she fell in love with haiti period and you know haiti is um a lot of the indigenous africans in those areas had their traditions they kept the traditions out of the out of all the slaves during the slave trade they're the slaves that were allowed to hold on to their traditions. The, the slaves that came to the US that were stripped of their traditions. They couldn't drum, they couldn't dance, uh, but you find that the slaves in other uh, parts of the Americas and, and the Caribbean still hold, held on to their culture. So especially Haiti. And so she fell in love with Haiti and she did her studies there. And uh, she was actually initiated in the voodoo religion um, and became a priestess. And they have like a different, like in, in Catholic, you have saints. In the, um, in the voodoo, you have uh, deities. So the deity that she was given was Dambala, which means snake. And the dance, you know, is your whole body moves like a snake. So she embodied that and came, came back to the US and, um, you know, wrote her report and did her performance. And uh, she decided she was going to create a technique that will be able to teach you how to move traditionally and also be able to do te uh, technique, ballet technique. And she called it the Dunham technique and that's how it was born. And uh, that's why I was attracted to it because when I was in Kenya and I saw the movement, I could see the cultural movement, cultural context in the technique. And then I could see the, the, the actual technique, you know, the ballet and which I was studying at that time. So anyway, to make a long story short, I was, uh, Catherine Dunham uh, in 1999 certified me to continue her legacy. I studied with her from 1984, 85 until 2006 when she passed away. And I'm one of the few certified uh, teachers in the United States of the Dunham technique. Catherine Dunham taught me how to, just by watching her and reading, uh, listening to her and reading her books, how to use dance in a way to be able to speak uh, to be number one, humanitarian, number two, to be able to have a, a platform to speak, uh, active, uh, to be an activist, 
an example that she had when I think she was 80 years old when Haitians were being shipped to the United States. And I believe this was either during the Reagan years or yeah, I think it was during the Reagan years. They were trying to escape uh, and come to the United States as, for seeking asylum. And the United States um, would stop them in the middle of the ocean and turn them around. And they didn't come with the great boats and ships. So a lot of them died at sea because when they turned around, they couldn't make it back to Haiti. So this was very in inhumane. So she um, spoke out, she went on a hunger strike and being a dancer, she was on the news. So she brought this story to the forefront in the news that this is what the US is doing, turning around Haitians because they're not, um, they're, they're black people and American doesn't want to, to welcome them, you know, just like what happened in this, uh, to the, in the south of the border in Mexico where they separated children. That was happening way back in, in the, when Miss Dunham was about 80 years old. And, uh, and even before that, when she was, when she had her own company, she had the first African-American traveling company in, the, in this country. And she traveled to 50 countries at that time. And she was, she came up in the time when lynching was going on. So she basically um, put it on stage and the US government was very annoyed about that because you know they didn't want to be exposed that they were actually lynching uh, black people for fun. So she put it on stage, you know, it's, uh, it's called Southland. And um, the, the government was trying to stop her from uh, putting up that piece. So she went, I think she went to Brazil first to, to, um, to uh, premiere it and then she took it to different countries. And this is what the United States is doing. So she said, use your platform to talk about things that may be uncomfortable politically and um, you know, speak out as a dancer, you have that platform. So I have always listened to her. And over the years, um, in in, not in Kenya, but in Sudan, they had this um, genocide, which was horrific. And the whole world was very quiet while this genocide was going on. And I remembered Ms. Dunham's word, if something is bothering you on that level, put it on stage and that is gonna be a safe place for, for you to tell your story. So I, I choreographed a piece called The Devil Comes on Horseback. This was when the um, Sudanese were killing millions and millions of, of their own people through genocide uh, in South Sudan. Uh, they would come in, uh, they'll call the Janja weed. They would come in on horseback and uh, jeeps, burn villages, rape the women, kill the, kill the, hus the hu fathers and husbands. And people would literally run for their lives. And the reason why I really was, um, was so, so moved by this, this horrific move, because my brother worked in the, uh, with the United Nations in one of, of the, um, refugee camps right at the border that all hundreds and hundreds of Sudanese would come through across Kenya. So he was there, you know, feeding them and all that. And he'd tell me these horrific, horrific stories. And I decided to put it on stage. So um, Janjaweed means the devil comes on horseback. So it's a whole ballet, it's a suite. There's an act one, act two and act three. I'm just gonna show you a little bit of my choreography and my students, um, uh, showing you how the Janjaweed would come in, you know, with, with their military uh, wear and attack the village, and then I'll show um, you a little bit. Anindo, of Anindo, we might have to show that a little bit later because uh, we're coming to the end of this time. So, okay. um, so uh, we'll have to come back to that and go to Ananya next. Okay, um, but thank you to so it. much. Okay, uh, it's been. It's such a wonderful um, story that of your life and experiences, and it's extremely powerful. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, for um, and, me. <laughs> and we'll come come back to a discussion and and try to find time to see your video. Um, so going to Ananya, Ananya um, Chatterjee next. Mm -hmm. um, Hi. I think your video your video has to be spotlighted. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Um, I am uh, actually thinking, uh, listening to everyone before me, especially Caroline, I'm going to share, um, I'm going to change what I was going to talk about. Um, let me begin by offering my greetings to the land. I'm here 
on the stolen and unceded lands of the Dakota Oyate and the Anishinaabe peoples. I hold up this land, Mini Shota Makoche, and I share with you what my Dakota sisters have taught me, Mitakuye Oasin, meaning we are all related. Thank you. Um, so I will say that I learned dance in my home of Kolkata uh, in the western side of in the eastern side of India and um, I learned dance in different ways. Um, I was trained in some of the tra traditional forms but at the same time the state I'm from Bengal was one of the two at that time uh, one of the two left governed um, states, which meant there was a very strong tradition of people's theater. And there was a strong women's movement as well, um, where so I would actually leave my, you know, I would learn a particular kind of dance in my guru's studio, and then I would come out and stand at the bus stop to go to the go home. And there would be a women's group uh, doing street theater about, you know, domestic abuse about something that was and you know the I want to say that the women's movement in India at that time was multi focused so there was the anti price rise agitation there was a literacy movement there was you know the movement for nutrition it was multifaceted and I really learned um, how to think of a, of how you know the, the notion of the personalist political was very clear to me. It was in every aspect of our lives. At any rate, um, coming from my guru studio and dancing about some notion of divine love and coming outside at the bus stop um, and witnessing what was going on uh, really would tear my body in half because I was like, goodness, why I want to, I, I love the urgency of the street theater and I love the beauty of the form I was learning uh, with my guru. However, um, I couldn't resolve that conflict. I really felt being like I was torn in half. And then I later on, um, you know, I, that's how I come to my work from that experience of wanting to have a clear, a clear form, a formal base where I could articulate my cultural context and um, thinking about the urgency that street theater brings. Street theater artists are really constantly teaching us about how to be aware practitioners. So I hear, I would hear people say, okay, I'm perf you're performing outside at this place and you notice a child is you know, a, a child has sort of walked there. You have to swoop up the child so they don't get in the way of traffic in the middle of performance and then, you know, and then seat them down and go on from there. So improvisation is crucial to that. Uh, learning how to improvise and being uh, what, is, what is called wakibal, really um, aware of your surroundings is super important. Um, that's how I come to my work. I, I describe myself as making what I call people-powered dances of transformation. And I believe in the transformative power of dance. I really believe that dance emerging from the sense of energetic, you know, energetic forces can actually reach out through the heat we generate to audiences, to people around us, and invite them to be in movement around us. Um, and as an artist, you know, I've collaborated over the years with many organizers and I'm very clear about my skills. I am not a legislator. My job is not to pass legislation. My job as an artist is to reveal the human, the human condition inside of issues so that um, I can provoke questions in the minds of my audiences. I can invite them to a discussion and I can sort of create the ferment, the sort of ferment of questions that can then um, create the groundswell for change people, for changing people's minds or for inviting them to a particular platform for conversation. Um, and, you know, people, culture shifts happen 
are not just because of legislation. Culture shifts happen because people start to realize, oh, wow, that's pretty inhuman of us to do that. So how can we think about it? So revealing the human content is really important. And I think that's where the work of culture is. Um, I work with my company of um, artists, bl uh, black, indigenous, and uh, off-color women and femme artists. And, you know, the, the who it, I began, I began, when I began, I we used to say it's a women of color company. And as descriptors have shifted and has, as people have found their ways to articulate how they feel comfortable, the description has changed. And I think remaining flexible has been um, really important to welcome in the different voices. Um, I want to say that most recently, in the last, the, over the last year, I was making a piece about boundaries and borders and home loss and belonging. It came about, it, I started to think about it because of what was going on in South Asia. And I, you know, and the pandemic started. And then here we were, I'm in Minneapolis. Um, many of you will have heard about the dreadful murder of George Floyd and the uprising that followed. So I live on Lake Street and, you know, all of Lake Street was burning during the uprising. Um, so all around me, all over here is that, is the impact and the aftermath of that kind of pandemic, the pandemic of racial hatred. Um, it's right here. And then related to that, we had another pandemic that is the crisis of affordable housing and primarily black and brown people um, a lot of them, women and femme identified people, were on the streets actually living in our parks because, you know, this constancy of like, no, not here, move on, move on. Um, it was, it's really another pandemic. So we were dancing in our city's parks. There's a park two blocks from my house, and th that was the site of, um, that was the site of uh, uh, a, sh a camp for um, unhoused indigenous and black femmes actually, femmes only. So it was right here. So, I mean, you know, how do you dance about home adjacent to people who are constantly being pushed on from wherever they're making home? It was really something to understand um, how we must examine the function of art. Um, and at the same time, um, I, you know, I've been examining for a while um, how not to dance from a place of privilege because dance is something really amazing but it you know the way it's functioned within the economy of capitalism is that we have to offer you know it, it's an expen it becomes expensive and it really doesn't uh, you know dance training often seems to be for those who can afford it um, so how can we dance differently or from a different place where dance is about accessing that joy um, so, you know, we made some dance films where we danced everywhere on the streets in the middle of the wreckage and accessing, you know, the beauty of this. This is, you know, native land. So the beauty of this indigenous land, um, but which has obviously, which has so much blood on it. Um, I wanted to show several images, but I think um, I will not do that. I will say that the most recent part of my work has been to align my work with nonviolent direct action um, and and that's because I think once you are ready to do something the universe calls you to it so I've been more and more called to um, you know sort of different kind of rallies to dance on the street dancing on the street means that I have to give up some of the most um, the one of the most uh, something that I love doing which is footwork that kind of footwork rhythm, you know, that contact with the ground gives me the vibration of it really fills me with joy and pleasure. But when you're on the street, you know, you have to be careful, whatever. So I have to find other ways to generate energy. And that is through, I find this connectivity with people when you're out there in the street dancing, very important um, and dedicating, dedicating your energy to a larger cause. I think I have learned to dance differently because of this kind of work. And most recently we were in 
um, actually two weeks ago we were in Palisade, Minnesota, uh, which is the site of one of the biggest environmental disasters right now in the U.S. Uh, it's a site of Line 3, with the Line 3 which is being built. And, it, you know, again, Native and Indigenous activists are leading the way. They are reminding us. They are, uh, a couple of Native women are there on hunger strike. This is their 21st day of hunger strike. And they're reminding us that Enbridge, you know, this company which is constantly building these pipelines, bringing the dirtiest tar sands, and will, you know, we'll, they keep reminding us, <laughs> we can't drink oil, uh, we need to drink water, and it's really devastating to see what is happening. At any rate, we were there offering a dance um, that I had created after visiting and dancing at Standing Rock. So, you know, this is this kind of dancing I think it's I think what the pandemic has is teaching us is to dance differently, to take dance away from the extractive capitalist economy where, you know, I think it seems that we highlight stars and divas and, you know, and those of us coming from India, you know, there's so much caste privilege that is built into traditional dance. There's so much gender violations built into traditional dance. So how to move away from all of that and find another place of dancing from spirit, from joy, from justice, from imagining. How can our dance imagine a just universe where we could we can share space and rhythm um, and offer hold up our shared humanity? Um, that's been my work of late. I think I'll stop there, Shauna, um, so that other oh, yeah. discussion. It Yes, thank you so much, Ananya. What a beautiful message. Um, and thank you for your generosity and trying to, to end early due to our time considerations. Um, we, I know that many people will want to see the images. So if we can, we'll come back to that. I, I have hope for that. And um, I think I'll pass it to Annabella Lenzu. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody, and, and it's a privilege to be here uh, to, to be part of with Anindo and Anania and um, Yana and share our love and, and passion for dance, our medium that we communicate, you know, is our um, way to be in the world. So thank you so much. I am uh, Nabila Lenzo. I'm a choreographer from Argentina. I currently live in New York City. I am in the land of the Lenape. And um, I am a mother and an immigrant in the United States. I moved here uh, 16 years ago. So um, I prepare a presentation um, uh, that is exactly 12 minutes. So we we'll keep it on time. So let me share it with you. Can I do that, Yana? Yeah, yeah, you can share. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. And um, as I talk, I will show you some images of my work. Uh huh. One second. It's coming. Okay. I do this every day in the teaching, but some <laughs> there we are. Sure. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it now. Great, thank you so much. Okay. So um, thank you so much for this wonderful um, experience on this Sunday morning. Um, let's look at some um, short video of my work.
So for me, art is a political art and dance is discipline and revolt. My body is my country. I react to the environment and I see the body as a receptacle and messenger of the multiple realities that we're immersed in. My work reflects my experience as a Latina artist living in New York and comes from a deep examination of my motivation as a woman mother and immigrant. Performance is the conduit for examining cultural identity through form and content, as well as our relationship between people and society. Sharing my point of view of life with others is my duty and my pleasure. I investigate the logic of performance and the role of a dancer in our culture today, redefining the parameters of dance and theater. My work lives inside and outside of the theatrical traditions and venues, as well as on the screen. My art is about celebration and criticism of social, political, and cultural barriers. It's a ceremony of awareness. I love to work and collaborate in an atmosphere of creativity, respect, responsibility, honesty, independence, and freedom. And just as I aim to integrate mind, body, and spirit, I write, I choreograph, and I teach. It is my hope that in my works I choreograph, artists and audience find themselves walking in the same direction to integrate mind, body, and spirit. I have never in my life imagined to do anything but sharing dance, teaching dance and choreographic dance. From my early thought and memories, dance has been my life. Dance underly, underlines all that I am. I've been having a lot of issues. I've been deported of the United States. I was bulimic, I was anorexic. I suffer from panic attacks. And is my dance, my nest. When I write, I have a civil responsibility. I need to express ideas clearly and transparently. Whatever, when I choreograph, I can go to my darkest corners and to explore why I dance. Putting these words on paper forced me to be honest with myself. I used to make dances to make the people, the audience, feel, think, and emote. I think dance is to know oneself inside out. We cannot control the weather. We cannot control the economy, the politics, what people think, or what our partner feel. The only thing that we can control is our body, our microcosmos, and our attitude towards life. In our quest for guidance, we find inspiration. We may find that books are more encouraging sometimes than teachers and mentors. I often look about the Uruguayan poet and writer Eduardo Galeano in his book, The Book of the Embraces, and we he, he defined art in a single line. The only thing I know that art is art or art is shit. And why I always keep this phrase on mind? Because it's not common to come across complex themes of vitality and necessity of communication in production these days. I return to the idea that we construct our own false image of ourselves. There is a lot of fear in life. And I tell you this especially in the United States. It's a lot of fear. I never suffered fear in my life since I moved here to the United States. And because there is a lot of fear in life, we don't know how to deal with it. We make shit. We destroy and devalue ours and ourselves. And since we make a lot of shit before we do art, we always live in a dung. Life is given, given and there is not higher joy also say Eduardo Daniel. So I think about our role as a teachers. Why? Why we need to be political correct? They want to mislead us. 
They want to win a losing battle of ourselves. As a teacher, my responsibility is to guide and support, to give tools and opinions because good teachers are good teachers. There is no middle ground. Teaching must be conscious. Education is not just whatever. I speak about it, discuss it, reflect and meditate on it. Then I speak and I write it again. I feel that the art of dance is stagnant because there are just a few who investigate and try to keep the flame burning. We need invention, imagination, creativity, and knowledge. To criticize... <laughs> I'm sorry about these technical issues there. Um, so let me stop the sharing. There we go. So I was saying that for me, the field, the, the art of dance is stagnant because we don't question enough. That's why I am an artist. Without questioning, there is conformity which bring to mediocrity. To know how to value another is to know and appreciate oneself. And this is for me, activism. So making work is scary, but that's the only choice. I consider, um, you know, I've been teaching dance since 15 years old in three different countries and I'm 45. So I thought ballet, modern dance, composition, uh, flamenco pedagogy. I teach in Spanish and Italian and English. And I taught in a sport club, cultural centers, embassy, primary and second um, school colleges, university, private schools, ferias, et cetera, et cetera. And as Ananda say, I experienced the change in the life of the people when they encountered dance. So thinking about you know, what Anindo and Ananda say about how we can change the world. For me, is how to make accessible dance, especially in United States. You know, I came from a country where my education in dance was free, where we have, even we are a third world country, Argentina, we have the privilege to, to study for free. Everybody that wanna study, they can do it because art are more accessible, but we suffer for another thing. It's not a perfect world. You know, for me to be in an immigrant and to be living in South America and then in Europe and United States, I try to, um, take the best of each world and as a teacher encourage the younger generation to find their voice and to find their place in the world. And for me, it's not about, as I say before, my body is my country. So what about better dream that think that is not boundaries, that we are one citizens of the world. And I feel that dance does that. Erase who we are and embrace us all. So I invite everybody to dance. Thank you. Um, beautiful presentation and lovely to, to be able to, to hear your message and see your images as well. Um, amazing connections also between the three uh, incredible panelists. And I, um, I'm gonna just ask one, question, but I'm going to have to shorten the response time. So just please be aware of that. I also wanted to um, 
after to mention that af right after this, we'll be hearing from Nadra Asaf, who is here. Um, I think she'll be turning on there. She turned on her camera. <laughs> and also uh, Salima is one of the co-moderators as well, who's been looking in the um, chat and, and looking for questions. I don't know if we'll have the opportunity to ask too many questions just because of our time crunch. Um, so I, I really hear in all of your statements um, something that I'm, I'm referencing my notes where I see what um, Ananya said, how she's examining not to dance from a place of privilege. And I hear this in each of the stories and each of the um, narratives. And um, I wonder how, um, like if, if you wanna say anything slightly further about that before we move, um, move to Nadra. Um, and I also believe that after Nadra, I wanted to mention there will be a, a short video and then we may have time at the very end to show, um, to show some of your, your other works. Okay, so please um, feel free to respond um, if anybody wants to raise their hand or, or speak. Um, of the panelists. Yes, Ananya. I can share what I meant. For me, you know, it's it's important to recognize, for instance, that um, how certain kinds of things uh, linger on, right? So, uh, you know, India was colonized, but here I am part of settler colonialism on indigenous land. So I have, you know, for instance, you know, in Indian dance, we begin with the pranam, a salutation to the earth, to Mother Earth. Um, I have transformed that, you know, working with um, Dakota and Anishinaabe activists. So to make, make this a salutation of Dakota land, um, simply, you know, recognizing the f struggles and the, the travesties that are on the ground are so important and i think we begin to think um you know the privilege of dancing like i i love dancing on the stage but um you know for instance one of the things i will i i i know that sometimes dance makes us connect so um a couple of years ago we were invited to the bethlehem international performing arts festival and you know dancing in palestine and seeing witnessing the horror that is on the on the ground has was so difficult and one of the activists in Hebron said Ananya dance on the street dance on the street so you can inspire people and that and we were going to and you know a, we saw this um, the, the, we saw this young young man being harassed uh, by the Israeli police and we couldn't we were just all shook up and we couldn't do anything um, and so I still I what I, my privilege means that I can't forget that promise I made that activist. So I, I know that in my life I will have to go back and offer my dance as I promised him because it was a great honor to be asked. So to recognize, you know, I think part of dismantling privilege is recognizing where dance can do its work. Right. For me, that's what it means. Beautiful. Yes. Um, Annabella and Indo, do you want to say anything more to I, that or? I want to reply to the question that Leanne has here in the chat. Can you share your thought on how pandemic has affected the work of dance and theater and how you could stand in solidarity with dancers and those in the arts who may struggle more during the pandemic? Um, you know, for me is support. You know, I teach in different institutions. I mentor different young choreographers all over the world, you know, to online platforms. It's for me, you know, because I already passed many things in my life and, you know, and, and we are all survivors. I can give strength and have this conversation on the phone, you know, uh, on Zoom, on Skype and be there, you know, many of my students, you know, last semester at NYU, there was uh, with COVID laying down in bed. And I say, well, disconnect, you know, 
dress and they say, no, I just want to hear your voice. I want to be part. So something that dance does for us is create this community. And, you know, and I find Yana and we find each other through online to create that we are not so alone. And that's super, super important that you've been available for others. And, you know, this is what I always say, you know, you serve the dance, you serve the art community, but you serve the people. And so- Yes, I think dance, yeah, dancers really know how to form community and we build community when we're working together in inter-embodiment. And um, that, in fact, that's how I met Nadra, who will be speaking next, um, is through a dance that we were in, in 2018, I'm surprised that I was dancing after 50, but <laughs> um, but uh, Nadra and I were in a piece uh, by Bill Evans um, together. And, and so it will be, you know, it's interesting that all of us have connected in these ways through movement. And, and even Anindo, um, we met, you know, in a dance studio um, when I had the company Asava Dance and she was she was surprised because the name Asava Dance comes from the exact area of Kenya where she's where she's from, you know, so um, did you want to say anything uh, to close Anindo or do you want to Because of time, uh, unmute, have a, yeah. because of time, I have a recording session I have to run to, but um, I just want to <laughs> Uh, this Zoom has really, because, uh, you know, I look at art as medicine, so dance is medicine. So um, it's, I've been using that with my students, I teach at USC and also LAXA and at Debbie Allen Dance Academy. So it's been, we've been using it as medicine through this pandemic, uh, as medicine to send out through energy for, to heal whoever's suffering physically, mentally, uh, uh, from a financial point of view. So we're sending out all these energies. So that's how we've been handling the pandemic. It's been tough, but you know, like community together, we can all, we're gonna get through it and get to the other side yes. of it. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, you're also amazing. If there's any way that you could share those images and, and video perhaps um, in the way, in you know, through the, the chat to panelists or something. If you have to go, then um, perhaps we could show those a little bit later in the session, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward to um, not introduce Nadra very, very briefly. I'm gonna share my screen very quickly and share her, um, I'm sorry, her, her bio very quickly. Um, and Nadra is, um, an incredible, incredible person. Um, and she is also a full-time dance professor in Lebanon, where she's lived for the last 30 years. Um, in fact, her heritage is also connected to Oklahoma. So I don't know if, um, if Caroline is still here, but um, that would be an interesting connection to make. So I, I want to pass it to Nanra because she's um, speaking um, today for, for a, um, a short session. And after this time, we will have a, a short video transition to kind of process some of the things that we're, we're listening to. And then we will go to the next panel um, where Nadra is one of the co-facilitators. And I, I wanna thank the um, co-facilitators as well who are here, like Salima and Nadra. And I'm sorry that we're not getting to all the questions that we want to get to right now um, because of our pressure of time. So um, Nadra, let's, let's take it to you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that I feel very um, privilege to be here uh, today. I was speaking earlier to um, Shauna and I have been suffering from migraines uh, the last few days because um, some of you might know that Lebanon has been uh, struggling and suffering since October 2019 um, when a uh, revolution took place and the last three days have seen a resurgence of this revolution and there's been lots of fires um, around my house and so breathing 
in the the smoke has has caused some very bad pain in my head. Um, so, but I am very very blessed and an honored to be here and to have listened to all these stories that have touched me and actually brought me to tears at some point. Um, I I am I as Shauna said, my mother is a Native American Indian and my father um, is Lebanese, and those are the the uh, ethnicities that I carry in my body. Also, um, I have a very strong connection to this small piece of earth um, that I happen to be living in um, and have been here for the last 30 years. I found it very interesting that, that the three panelists um, all are living in the United States, but are not, not from the United States. And they also come from pieces of this earth that suffer a lot. Um, so I guess I just felt this deep connection and have been very, yeah, very blessed to be able to be here and listen and in a way, um, feel like not giving up because lately I have felt like I want to give up. But after today, I feel stronger, even though I am crying, <laughs> I do feel much stronger. It's, it's been a blessing. So thank you. And, and I'm very honored that Shauna asked me to be a part of this. I, I also met her at a very um, interesting time um, in my life and, and we connected really beautifully um, through our body movement. So anyway, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't have more to say than that. And, and that's it. Just, uh, I love you all. And I'm very honored to be here. Um, Nadra, what you've said is very powerful and beautiful. And, um, and I know that we'll continue to com communicate and, and hear from you also in the next session. And um, I, I think I, it, you know, it's very difficult to close each of these sessions because it is like you say, Nadra, um, all of these like stories are from different parts of the earth that are suffering and, and, and there, there's so much connection to each story, but I do know that we will be creating a library of sorts or a database online of, um, of these different, you know, short sessions and that will connect to different people's websites and um, we will find ways to keep connecting um, perhaps in, in another session where we go more deep, okay? So, um, and, and I see all of these connections between all of the stories in the previous session and to the next where we will be um, working through some embodied practice as well. So I, um, I am sorry that I need 